King John's Christmas, a poem by A. A. Milne. King John was not a good man. He had his little ways, and sometimes no one spoke to him for days and days and days. And men who came across him when walking in the town gave him a supercilious stare, or passed with their noses in the air. And bad King John stood dumbly there, blushing beneath his crown. King John was not a good man, and no good friends had he. He stayed in every afternoon, but no one came to tea. And round about December, the cards upon his shelf, which wished him lots of Christmas cheer and fortune in the coming year, were never from his near and dear, but only from himself. King John was not a good man, yet had his hopes and fears. They'd given him no presents now for years and years and years. But every year at Christmas, while minstrels stood about, collecting tribute from the young for all the songs they might have sung, he stole away upstairs and hung a hopeful stocking out. King John was not a good man. He lived his life aloof. Alone, he thought a message out while climbing on the roof. He wrote it down and propped it against the chimney stack. To all and sundry near and far, F. Christmas in particular, and signed it not Johannes R., but very humbly, Jack. I want some crackers, and I want some candy. I think a box of chocolates would come in handy. I don't mind oranges, I do like nuts, and I should like a pocket knife that really cuts. And oh, Father Christmas, if you love me at all, bring me a big red India rubber ball. King John was not a good man. He wrote this message out and got him to his room again, descending by the spout. And all that night he lay there, a prey to hopes and fears. I think that's him coming now. Anxiety bedewed his brow. He'll bring one present anyhow, the first I had for years. Forget about the crackers and forget the candy. I'm sure a box of chocolates would never come in handy. I don't like oranges, I don't want nuts, and I have got a pocket knife that almost cuts. But oh, Father Christmas, if you love me at all, bring me a big red India rubber ball. King John was not a good man. Next morning when the sun rose up to tell a waiting world that Christmas had begun, and people seized their stockings and opened them with glee. And crackers, toys, and games appeared, and lips with sticky sweets were smeared. King John said grimly, as I feared, nothing again for me. I did want crackers, and I did want candy. I know a box of chocolates would come in handy. I do love oranges, I did want nuts. I haven't got a pocket knife, not one that cuts. And oh, if Father Christmas had loved me at all, he would have brought a big red India rubber ball. King John stood by the window and frowned to see below. The happy bands of boys and girls all playing in the snow. A while he stood there watching and envying them all. When through the window, big and red, they hurtled by his royal head and bounced and fell upon the bed. An India rubber ball. And oh, Father Christmas, my blessings on you fall for bringing him a big red India rubber.
visit from St. Nicholas by Clement Clark Moore. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of a new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen. On Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blixen. To the top of the perch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So, up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with a sleigh full of toys, <laughs> and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur, from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys was flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry, his droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke, it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I thought when I saw him in spite of myself, a wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word went straight to his work and filled all the stockings and then turned with a jerk laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose he sprung to his sleigh to his team gave a whistle and away they all flew like the down of a thistle but I heard him exclaim ere he drove out of sight happy Christmas to all and to all a good night
The Legend of the Christmas Tree by Lucy Wheelock Two little children were sitting by the fire one cold winter's night. All at once, they heard a timid knock at the door, and one ran to open it. There, outside in the cold and the darkness, stood a child with no shoes upon his feet and clad in thin, ragged garments. He was shivering with cold, and he asked to come in and warm himself. Yes, come, cried both the children. You shall have our place by the fire, come in. They drew the little stranger to their warm seat and shared their supper with him and gave him their bed while they slept on a hard bench. In the night, they were awakened by strains of sweet music and looking out, they saw a band of children in shining garments approach the house were playing on golden harps, and the air was full of melody. Suddenly, the stranger child stood before them, no longer cold and ragged, but clad in silvery light. His soft voice said, I was cold, and you took me in. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was tired, and you gave me your bed. I am the Christ child, wandering through the world to bring peace and happiness to all good children. As you have given to me, so may this tree give rich fruit to you. So saying, he broke a branch near the fir tree that grew near the door, and he planted it in the ground and disappeared. But the branch grew into a great tree, and every year, it bore wonderful golden fruit for the kind children.
Little Piccola by Nora A. Smith. Part 1. Piccola lived in Italy, where the oranges grow, and where all the year the sun shines warm and bright. <laughs> I suppose you think Piccola is a very strange name for a little girl. But in her country, it was not strange at all. And her mother thought it was the sweetest name a little girl ever had. Piccola had no kind father, no big brother or sister, and no sweet baby to play with and love. She and her mother lived all alone in an old stone house that looked on a dark, narrow street. They were very poor, and the mother was away from home almost every day, washing clothes and scrubbing floors and working hard to earn money for her little girl and herself. So, you see, Piccola was alone a great deal of the time, and if she had not been a very happy, contented little child, I hardly know what she would have done. She had no playthings except a heap of stones in the backyard that she used for building houses and a very old, very ragged doll that her mother had found in the street one day. But there was a small round hole in the stone wall at the back of the yard, and her greatest pleasure was to look through that into her neighbor's garden. When she stood on a stone and put her eyes close to the hole, she could see the green pass in the garden and smell the sweet flowers, and even hear the water splashing into the fountain. She had never seen anyone in the garden, for it belonged to an old gentleman who did not care about grass and flowers. One day in the autumn, her mother told her that the old gentleman had gone away and had rented his house to a family of little American children who had come with their sick mother to spend the winter in Italy. After this, Piccola was never lonely, for all day long, the children ran and played and danced and sang in the garden. It was several weeks before they saw her at all. And I'm not sure they ever would have done so, but one day the kitten ran away, and in chasing her, they came close to the wall and saw Piccola's black eyes looking through the hole in the stones. They were a little frightened at first. They did not speak to her, but the next day she was there again. And Rose, the oldest girl, went up to the wall and talked to her a little while. When the children found that she had no one to play with and was very lonely, they talked to her every day and often brought her fruits and candies and passed them through the hole in the wall. One day they even pushed the kitten through. But the hole was hardly large enough for her, and she mewed and scratched and was very much frightened. After that, the little boy said he would ask his father if the hole might not be made larger, and then Piccola could come in and play with him. The father had found out that Piccola's mother was a good woman, and that the little girl herself was sweet and kind, so that he was very glad to have some of the stones broken away, and an opening was made for Piccola to come in. How excited she was, and how glad the children were when she first stepped into the garden. She wore her best dress, a long, bright-colored woolen skirt and a white waist. Round her neck was a string of beads, and on her feet were little wooden shoes. It would seem very strange to us, would it not, to wear wooden shoes? But Piccola and her mother had never worn anything else, and never had any money to buy stockings. Piccola almost always ran about barefooted, like the kittens and chickens and the little ducks. What a good time they had that day, and how glad Piccola's mother was that her little girl could have such a pleasant, safe place to play in while she was away at work. By and by, December came, and the little Americans began to talk about Christmas. One day, when Piccola's curly head and bright eyes came peeping through the hole in the wall, and they ran to her and helped her in, and as they did so, they all asked her at once what she thought she would have for a Christmas present. A Christmas present, said Piccola. Why, what is that? All the children looked surprised at this. And Rose said rather gravely, Dear Piccola, don't you know what Christmas is? Oh yes, Piccola knew it was the happy day when the baby Christ was born. And she had been to church on that day and heard the beautiful singing and had seen the picture of the babe lying in the manger. 
with cattle and sheep sleeping round it. Oh yes, she knew all that very well. But what was a Christmas present?
Little Piccola by Nora A. Smith. Part 2. Oh, yes, Piccola knew it was the happy day when the baby Christ was born. And she had been to church on that day and heard the beautiful singing and had seen the picture of the babe lying in the manger with cattle and sheep sleeping round her. Oh, yes, she knew all that very well. But what was a Christmas present? Then the children began to laugh and to answer her all together. There was such a clatter of tongues that she could hear only a few of the words now and then, such as chimney, Santa Claus, stockings, reindeer, Christmas Eve, candies, and toys. Piccola put her hands over her ears and said, Oh, I can't understand one word. You tell me, Rose. Then Rose told her all about jolly Santa Claus, with his red cheeks and white beard and fur coat, and about his reindeer and sleigh full of toys. Every Christmas Eve, said Rose, he comes down the chimney and fills the stockings of all the good children. So, Piccola, you hang up your stocking, and who knows what a beautiful Christmas present you will find when morning comes. Of course, Piccola thought this was a delightful plan and was pleased to hear about it. Then all the children told her of every Christmas Eve they could remember and of the presents they had had so that she went home thinking of nothing but dolls and hoops and balls and ribbons and marbles and wagons and kites. She told her mother about Santa Claus, and her mother seemed to think that perhaps he did not know there was any little girl in that house, and very likely he would not come at all. But Piccola felt very sure Santa Claus would remember her, for her little friends had promised to send a letter up the chimney to remind him. Christmas Eve came at last. Piccola's mother hurried home from her work. They had had their little supper of soup and bread, and soon it was bath time. Time to get ready for Santa Claus. But, oh, Piccola remembered then for the first time that the children had told her she must hang up her stocking. And she hadn't any. And neither had her mother. How sad it was. Now Santa Claus would come and perhaps be angry because he couldn't find any place to put the present. The poor little girl stood by the fireplace and the big tears began to run down her cheeks. Just then her mother called to her. Hurry, Piccola, come to bed. What should she do? But she stopped crying and tried to think. And in a moment she remembered her wooden shoes and ran off to get one of them. She put it close to the chimney and said to herself, Surely Santa Claus will know what it's there for. He will know I haven't any stockings, so I gave him the shoe instead. And she went off happily to bed and was asleep almost as soon as she had nestled close to her mother's side. The sun had only just begun to shine next morning when Piccola awoke. With one jump, she was out on the floor and running toward the chimney. The wooden shoe was lying where she had left it. You could never, never guess what was in it. Piccola had not meant to wake her mother, but the surprise was more than any little girl could bear and yet be quiet. So she danced to the bed with a shoe in her hand, calling, Mother, Mother, look, look! See the present Santa Claus brought me? Her mother raised her head and looked into the shoe. Why, Piccola, she said. A little chimney swallow nestling in your shoe. What a good Santa Claus to bring you a bird. Good Santa Claus, dear Santa Claus, cried Piccola. And she kissed her mother and kissed the bird and kissed the shoe. And even threw kisses up the chimney, she was so happy. When the birdling was taken out of the shoe, they found that it did not try to fly, only to hop about the room. And as they looked closer, they could see that one of his wings was hurt a little. But the mother bound it up carefully so that it did not seem to pain him. And he was so gentle that he took a drink of water from a cup and even ate crumbs and seeds out of Piccola's hands. She was a proud little girl when she took her Christmas present to show the children in the garden. They had had a great many gifts. Dolls that could say mama, bright picture books, trains of cars, toy pianos. But not one of their playthings was alive like Piccola's birdling. They were as pleased as she 
and Rose hunted about the house until she found a large wicker cage that belonged to a blackbird she once had. She gave the cage to Piccola, and the swallow seemed to make himself quite at home in it at once, and sat on the perch, winking his bright eyes at the children. Rose had saved a bag of candies for Piccola, and when she went home at last, with the cage and her dear swallow safely inside it, I am sure there was not a happier little girl in the whole country of Italy.
Roscoe the Rascal, Christmas Magic by Shauna Gorian. It was Roscoe's first Christmas with the McKendrick family. Late in the evening on Christmas Eve, 10-year-old James, 7-year-old Mandy, and Mom and Dad McKendrick were all in bed. Roscoe, their large German shepherd, lay near the front door, tossing and turning on his doggy bed. The lights on the Christmas tree had been shut off. The fire in the hearth had burned out, but Roscoe was wide awake. Roscoe lay thinking anxiously about what Mandy had told him, that tonight someone named Santa Claus would be visiting the house while everyone slept. Mandy had instructed her dog not to bark at Santa because she wouldn't want Roscoe to scare Santa away. She had told him what to expect, so Roscoe was prepared for a jolly old man with a white beard and a red suit to come hurtling down the chimney sometime after midnight. What time is it now, Roscoe wondered. And when will he get here? Roscoe knew only one thing for sure, that he would be tired tomorrow after all the sleep he would miss tonight. Roscoe tried to relax and think about something else. His mind wandered as he remembered the many pleasant things this December had brought. A Christmas parade with floats, marching bands, and holiday carolers. Mandy's school play. James's trip to the ice skating rink with friends, sugar cookies in the oven, and festive decorations all around the house. Roscoe had even gone on a horse-drawn sleigh ride with the whole family. Well, more of a horse-drawn wagon ride, really, but Mrs. McKendrick had called it a sleigh ride. The ride had taken place at a farm in the countryside on a chilly, dark evening. The family had donned mittens and hats and sipped hot cocoa as the horses whisked them through beautiful fields and woods lit up by rows and rows of colorful Christmas lights. The horses wore jingling bells around their necks that made them sound just like the horse in Mandy's favorite Christmas song. Roscoe had loved it. Yes, December was a magical month in the world of his people. Roscoe decided he, too, liked the festive holiday season as much as they did. So he thought maybe he ought to calm down and go to sleep. It was time to stop wondering when Santa would arrive. He looked out a nearby window. Tonight, the air outside was cool and damp, but no snow lay on the ground. Earlier today, it had rained and puddles had collected on the ground. Roscoe knew this kind of weather usually brought frost by morning and often puddles turned into very slippery patches of ice. He'd have to be careful tomorrow morning when they put him outside. Through the window, Roscoe could see the red and green crystals of sugar that James and Mandy had left on the driveway before they went to bed. The kids had made an odd mixture of uncooked oatmeal, birdseed, and colored sugar crystals, and then sprinkled the mixture outside the front door. Reindeer food, they called it. It was a snack for Santa's reindeer. The colorful crystals of sugar outside glittered under the strings of Christmas lights encircling the house. Roscoe wasn't sure if reindeer would eat birdseed, but he would be happy to look it up tomorrow if they didn't. Oh well, nothing else to do now but wait, he thought with a sigh. A wide yawn, finally escaping his mouth. The tired dog snuggled into his soft bed and soon drifted off into a peaceful sleep. Hours later, Roscoe awoke with a jolt to the sound of footsteps on the roof. He remembered Mandy's desperate instructions because she knew he could make mischief sometimes. Please, please don't bark when you hear him, Roscoe. It's really important, Mandy had said. Santa doesn't want you to notice him when he's working. You might even want to pretend you're sleeping. So Roscoe obediently clamped his mouth shut, holding back the bark that usually came out when he heard a noise. But he just had to find out what was happening up there on the roof. He just had to be sure it was indeed Santa Claus. He could not just pretend to be asleep. Sorry, Mandy, he thought. Quietly, he padded over to his doggy door at the back of the house. He passed the Christmas tree, the plate of cookies and carrots, and the glass of milk that the kids had left for Santa in the living room, not daring to touch the food after Mandy's warning. Roscoe slipped through the doggy door, out into the frosty night. He'd have a good view of whomever was on the roof from the far edge of the backyard. 
If he could only get there without being seen, he didn't want to scare away Santa. Soon he made it to the edge of the yard and turned to look up at the McKendrick house. There, a large, beautiful red sleigh sat balanced over the tip of the roof. It seemed to have appeared out of nowhere. Wow, he was impressed. Now that's what you call a sleigh, Mom, he thought. But no one was up there. No jolly old man in a red suit. Not even one reindeer, just the sleigh. But this had to mean Santa Claus was here. So where was he? And where were the reindeer? Roscoe thought that maybe he could get a better view from the other side on the street. So he crept quietly back across the damp lawn and out toward the driveway. Maybe I'll get a look at that reindeer food while I'm out there, he thought. Like most big dogs, Roscoe was always hungry for a snack. Once again, he was in for a surprise. Not only were no reindeer on the other side of the house, but the reindeer food on the driveway was all gone. Not one red or green sugar crystal was left to sparkle in the night. The reindeer must have already eaten it up. But how had they eaten it so quickly without being noticed? And where were they now? He walked out onto the street in the dark night and sniffed about, carefully searching for traces of nine reindeer. They couldn't have gotten far, could they? Although Mandy said they can fly, right? Just then, Roscoe heard a loud clunk on the rooftop, followed by some jingling bells, like the sound that the horses had made on the wagon ride. He heard an animal whinny and stomp its hoof. He thought he saw the tips of antlers moving about on the other side of the roof. Aha! He could not miss his chance to see those reindeer. He started to run, heading across the driveway and toward the backyard. But he had not looked closely at where he was going, and it was dark out. His paws hit a long, wide, frozen puddle on the pavement. Zip! Flop! Roscoe sailed across the ice, slipping and sliding until he smacked the cold, hard, dry pavement at the other end of the frozen puddle with the full force of his body. Ouch, that hurt, he thought, sprawled out on the ground, resting his aching legs. I should have seen that coming. But maybe there was still time to see Santa and his reindeer if he hurried. I'd better be more careful, though. He scrambled to his feet. In the backyard, Everything was silent again. Not a reindeer in sight. He looked to the roof. The sleigh was gone. How had it disappeared like that, he thought. It was just there a few moments ago. Roscoe sighed heavily. Defeated, he lowered his head and shuffled slowly back to his doggy door. Roscoe was fast and strong and smart. He was usually very good at sniffing out and finding whatever he was after. So how had Santa Claus and nine full-sized reindeer managed to get by him? He slipped inside the house to return to his doggy bed, pondering the question, his tail sagging in disappointment. Oh well, maybe next year, he thought sadly. But as he crossed the living room, he stopped and gasped. Colorful presents now surrounded the family's Christmas tree, and they were piled high. Big ones and little ones, some wrapped in patterned paper with shiny ribbons, some not wrapped at all. The glass of milk was empty and cookies and carrots were gone, only crumbs remained. Santa! Santa must have been here inside the house! He must have delivered all these gifts and swept out through the chimney just like Mandy said he would in just a few minutes flat. Magic! It must be Christmas magic, Roscoe thought. That's how he does it. That's why I never really saw the reindeer. And oh my, James and Mandy will be delighted when they see this in the morning. Roscoe stood gazing at the extraordinary sight for a long time. Finally, he sighed and headed for his doggy bed. Settled in, he smiled the doggy smile of satisfaction. Next year, I'll know what to do. Merry Christmas from Roscoe the Rascal.
On the 13th day of Christmas, my true love phoned me up. Dear Calder, well, I suppose I should be grateful. You've obviously gone to a lot of trouble and expense. Or maybe off your head. Yes, I did like the birds. The small ones, anyway, were fun, if rather messy. But now the hens have roosted on my bed, and the rest are nested on the wardrobe. It's hard to sleep with all that cooing, let alone the cackling of geese whose eggs are everywhere, but mostly in a broken, smelly heap on the sofa. Oh, why should I mind? I can't get any peace anywhere. The lounge is full of drummers thumping tom-toms and sprawling lords crashed out from manic leaping. The kitchen is crammed with cows and milkmaids and smells of a million stink bombs and enough sour milk to last a year. The pipers, I'd forgotten them. They were no trouble. I paid them and they went. But I can't get rid of these young ladies. They won't stop dancing or turn the music down and they're always in the bathroom squealing as they skid across the flooded floor. No, I don't need a plumber around. It's just the swans. Where else can they swim? Poor things, I think they're going mad, like me. When I went to wash my hands, one ate the soap. Another swallowed the gold rings, and the, and the pear tree died. Too dry. So, thanks for nothing. Love. Goodbye. I've been good this year Make your list and check it twice I'll leave you a note right here Underneath the Christmas lights Carols and bells None of them help I still feel blue I just wanna need a fancy watch You can give the elves a break No, you can't make it in the shop You can't put it on your sleigh You know me so well Nobody else can do what you do I just wanna fall in Your ribbon and bow I don't need that extra stuff Oh, I just want to fall in love Santa, I've been good this year Make your list and check it twice I'll leave you a note right here Underneath the Christmas light
Sam's Christmas Present by Annie Besant. Sam was a very curious boy, and what he was curious about was his Christmas present. Mommy, where's my Christmas present? asked Sam, and she smiled and said, it's a secret, Sam. Sam stuck his tongue out and went in search of his father. Daddy, where's my Christmas present? asked Sam. I can't tell you, it's a secret, Sam, his father replied, smiling. I know what to do, Sam said. I will go gift hunting. He looked behind his father's desk and he found a gift box wrapped in red paper. But this is for Aunt Juju, said Sam, reading the tag. So he slipped into his parents' room and he found a gift box wrapped in gold paper. For Uncle Alfie, Sam read aloud from the tag. Then he opened his mother's cupboard and he found a gift box wrapped in purple paper. For our daughter Sophie was written on the tag. Sam went back to his room and sat on the floor feeling very sad. He had badly wanted to find his present. And then he saw a gift box wrapped in silver paper under his bed. This is for me, he shouted, reading the tag. Sam shook the box. He turned it around in his hands. What's inside? Oh, what could it be? Did he open it or leave it in the secret place? Are you curious to know what Curious Sam did with his gift? He put it back under the bed and decided to wait for Christmas.
Little Tree by E. E. Cummings Little tree, little silent Christmas tree You're so little, you're more like a flower Who found you in the green forest and were you very sorry to come away? I will comfort you because you smell so sweetly I will kiss your cool bark and hug you safe and tight, just as your mother would. Only don't be afraid. Look, the spangles that sleep all the year in a dark box, dreaming of being taken out and allowed to shine. The balls and chains, red and gold, the fluffy threads. Put up your little arms. And I'll give them all to you to hold. Every finger shall have its ring. And there won't be a single place dark or unhappy. Then, when you're quite dressed, you'll stand in the window for everyone to see. And how they'll stare. Oh, but you'll be very proud. And my little sister and I will take hands And looking up at our beautiful tree, we'll dance and sing, Noel, Noel.
Santa never forgets. Bertie was a very good boy. He was kind, obedient, truthful, and unselfish. He had, however, one great fault. He always forgot. No matter how important the errand, his answer always was, I forgot. When he was sent with a note for his teacher, his mother would find the note in his pocket at night. If he was sent to the store in a great hurry to get something for tea, he would return late without the thing he was sent for, but with his usual answer. His father and mother talked the matter over and decided that something must be done to make the little boy remember. Christmas was near, and Bertie was busy making out a list of things which Santa Claus was to bring to him. Santa Claus may forget some of those things, said his mother. He can't, replied Bertie, for I will write sled and skates and drum and violin and all the things on this paper. Then when Santa Claus goes to my stocking, he will find the list, he can see it and put the things in as fast as he reads. Christmas morning came, and Bertie was up at dawn to see what was in his stocking. His mother kept away from him as long as she could, for she knew what Santa Claus had done. Finally, she heard him coming with slow steps to the room. Slowly, he opened the door and came towards her. He held in his hands a list very much longer than the one he had made out. He put it in his mother's hand, while tears of disappointment fell from his eyes. See what Santa Claus left for me? He could have at least given me one thing. His mother opened the roll. There was a list of all the errands Birdie had been asked to do for six months. At the end of all was written in staring capitals, I forgot. Bertie wept for an hour. Then his mother told him they were all going to Grandpa's. For the first time, he would see a Christmas tree. Perhaps something might be growing there for him. It was very strange to Bertie, but on Grandpa's tree, he found everything he had written on his list. Was he cured of his bad habit? Not all at once. But from that day forward, whenever his mother saw that he was not listening to her, she would say, Remember, Santa Claus does not forget.
Santa's Scarves and Sweaters by Jade Maitre. You mightn't realize it, but after a thousand years of delivering presents to children all around the world, Santa Claus has plum tucker run out of ideas. And that's just for the kids, not to mention his woodland friends for whom he must also think of ideas every year. In fact, it's gotten so bad that the last few years he's decided to just buy everyone sweaters or scarves. I don't mind having a new sweater, said Sherbet the Sheep. I feel the cold during these windy, wintry days and nights leading up to Christmas. Having a new sweater every year suits me just fine. Me too, said Dudley the Reindeer. Though, to be honest, my legs are a little cold. I do hope he brings me some pants instead one year. Not me, declared Percy Penguin. I quite like receiving a scarf every year from Santa. I've never worn pants and never will. I don't see the point of them. Yes, but you and I have feathers on our bottoms, said Christy Chick. It's just not the same. Try asking Penelope over there. Indeed, it was sadly true. Penelope Pig had not a stitch on the bottom, although voluminous on top, thanks to the large, unwieldy scarf that Santa had brought her. But Penelope was a polite child and did not mention her chilly lower half, which had no hair or feathers to warm it. I like the color, she said very positively. And certainly politeness dictates that present receivers should never point out defects in their presence. Even when Santa goes off script and buys you a warm hat while the rest of you is completely bare. Just then, Birdie Bear put up his hand. Excuse me, he said. I don't think we're talking about the right thing. Does it matter whether we need a new scarf or sweater, or even a hat? The proper question should be, what should we get Santa for Christmas? Wasn't that the truth? Santa's friends all felt very ashamed of themselves. They turned a bright shade of pink. They put their heads together and thought about what Santa might like for Christmas. Even though it's cold in the North Pole, said Una Unicorn, I think he might get hot with all that present delivering, especially when he goes to places that have Christmas in summer. So they got him a novelty t-shirt. Santa was delighted. He wore it every day under his bright red working suit. Next year, he's asking for the pants.
The First Christmas by Marion Swinger. It never snows at Christmas in the dry and dusty land. Instead of freezing blizzards, there are palms and drifting sands. And years ago, a stable and a most unusual star. And three wise men who followed it by camel, not by car. While sleepy on the quiet hills, a shepherd gave a cry. He'd seen a crowd of angels in the silent, starlit sky. In the stable, ox and ass stood very still and calm, and gazed upon the baby, safe and snug in Mary's arms. Joseph, lost in shadows, face lit by an oil lamp's glow, stood wondering that first Christmas day. 2,000 years ago. Thank you.
The snow is falling and the cold wind is blowing hard. I'm locked inside tonight, but my heart is somewhere else. I'm thinking of you, babe, and all your crazy ways. I miss you more right now. It must be these holidays. You know you're my everything, the only present I want. And oh, what I give to be with you under the mistletoe. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Yeah, I got you on my mind. Merry Christmas from a distance. I wish you were here tonight. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Yeah, I got you on my mind. Merry Christmas from a distance. I wish you were here tonight. Oh, what I give to have you here, my dear. We could sing and laugh about our wonderful year. I can see it now. Yeah, your lips stained from the wine, and that sweet smile you have, your hand in mine. You know you're my everything, the only present I want. Oh, what I give to be with you under the mistletoe. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. I got you on my mind. Merry Christmas from a distance. I wish you were here tonight. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Yeah, I got you on my mind. Merry Christmas from a distance. I wish you were here tonight. I'm dreaming you home for the holidays. I'm dreaming you home right now. I'm dreaming you home because you're all I really want. I'm dreaming you home tonight. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, yeah, I got you on my mind. Merry Christmas from a distance. I wish you were here tonight. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, yeah, I got you on my mind. Merry Christmas from a distance. I wish you were here tonight. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Yeah, I got you on my mind. Merry Christmas from a distance. I wish you were here tonight.